have to approve it. If if I do it, you'll have to approve it. But if you do it, since it's we're signed in on, under your account. Okay, we are now recording. Great. Um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Steve Adams. Lauren McKean is my co-presenter, and here's our agenda for um, today for the using the library from home workshop. Um, the library has been going through lots of changes, and we we want to make you aware of those. So, here's our agenda for for the day. Um, um, we'll start off um, with an icebreaker, and um, then we'll, um, <clears throat> excuse me, then Lauren um, will go into the planning your classes section. Here's where we'll cover course reserves, um, you know, adding previously used materials and other digital resources because, um, you know, because of the COVID crisis, we won't be able to uh, um, scan new materials um, we have very, very, very limited staffing in the library um, um, because of this crisis. Um, so um, Lauren will give you a sense of how to um, make adjustments um, as we um, shift our services in the library. And then I'm going to go into um, accessing resources remotely. Here's where we'll go into um, the details of the Find It at NU button, which may seem basic, but there are a couple of um, details that I'd like to share um, that can really come in handy when you're doing something late in, late at night and you can't chat with anyone or you, you can't send us you know can't get a quick email answer um, and then for literature discovery I'd like to do a couple of demos with Google Scholar and Web of Science um, that go beyond the obvious um, and um, demo just demonstrate some po possibilities for literature searching and I'll also cover the JSTOR and HathiTrust COVID-19 programs. They're offering lots of free resources they, that they don't not normally offer, um, and you will have access to them all this quarter. You can add them to your classes, um, and they, there are some details about those um, that we'll share. We'll also, um, but Lauren's gonna talk a little bit about connecting from off campus using VPN and some additional library services. Um, so now we'll go into the icebreaker. Um, I'd like to, you to use the features in Zoom. Um, this will be a little Zoom test for those of you who are facilitating online classes. Um, um, basically, um, there's a, in your Zoom toolbar, there's an annotate button. Um, it also might be at the top. I'm looking at my, my own view right now, and it's um, the annotate button is in the toolbar. And what I'd like you to do is go to the annotate menu and choose a stamp, um, a check mark, you know, whatever color, color you want, um, and answer this question. You know, how would you rate your own skill level with Zoom? Are you advanced or are you still trying to figure out um, what exactly Zoom is? Um, where might you be on the spectrum? Yes, I think for the rest of us, it is on, it's under the view options toolbar that's at the top of our screens. Okay. I'm in present presentation view. So you can put your check, you know, somewhere on um, the purple, um, purple arrow spectrum. Um, I'm definitely um, in this intermediate camp. Um, we have, oh, oh, Drew never knew about the annotation feature. Great. Um, no problem. We're, we're, um, here to demonstrate new possibilities. All right. Um, we're going to go to the next slide. I'm going to clear these check marks. Thanks for, um, um, putting yourself, um, placing yourself on the spectrum. Clear all drawings. And okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, this is the next one. Um, also, go to now again, go to your annotate menu and um, answer this question How are you feeling about teaching online? Um, are you, you know, dreading it? Are you, you know, mildly anxious? Are you ready or are you ready and excited? Um, where do you lie on this spectrum? 
got a mildly anxious there. If um, um, that's the case, and if any, if, um, any of your anxiety <laughs> has to do with um, library resources, we will work, our, work to resolve that today. Um, also keep in mind, and Lauren's gonna cover this a little bit later, you can always have a librarian kind of jump into, or, um, you know, come to your class, do a class visit, um, do a guest lecture for your students um, to teach them how to do the th some of the things that we're showing today if you think your students will need to know that. Um, all right, that's our um, intro icebreaker. We got um, something in the chat. Um, it's just me chatting with Drew, helping him find the annotate button. Great. With, with the different interfaces with Mac and PC, it's hard to know where everything is located. Great. So, you know, with Zoom, it's always great to engage your audience. Um, we, we're doing this to kind of draw the energy into the presentation. Um, and I hope we've done that successfully. Right now, we're going to jump into Lauren's um, portion of the presentation. Um, really and truly, thank you for joining us today. And um, if you, we'll have a, a, quite a bit of time, I think, for Q&A toward the end of the workshop. And, um, but you can also put your questions in the chat. Now that Lauren's presenting, I'll be monitoring chat. All right, I'll stop sharing. Um, um, you can I'll jump on in. Oh, we got a couple of newer people. Um, all right, can, can you all see my screen? Yes, thumbs up. See the thumbs up, that's good. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm in Canvas right now. That's a screen that you should be seeing. Uh, I'd like to preface my little presentation by saying that I'm not a Canvas expert. There are the people at Digital Learning who can help you with all of your Canvas related questions. Um, but within Canvas, there is a uh, section that is dedicated to course reserves and that's a library service. So I'm gonna show you how to use course reserves within Canvas to make sure that you can um, make your electronic content available to your students this quarter. So as you all know, the library buildings are closed and only essential staff are permitted to um, enter the building right now. And so we can't handle physical items now and we can't create new scans of materials. So if in previous quarters you've had books and you've requested that a chapter or two be scanned to be put online for course reserves in Canvas, we can't do that this quarter. Um, just because we can't do that doesn't mean that there aren't options. There are some ways around this. So I'm going to go through three different scenarios uh, of, of what you might do depending on that scenario. So the first scenario is that you've used Canvas and course reserves previously to teach a specific course. So if you've done that previously and that book chapter or two that you had requested last quarter or last year or even several years ago, it's still available within course reserves and you can import it into your new course. So from Canvas, find my mouse, um, over on this left-hand menu, you can go down to where it says course reserves and click on that. This is a, a dummy course that I'm in not a real class. And then from this screen, there is a little button right up here that says add reserve items. So you can click on that. And then that will bring you to a page where it will have a listing of all of the courses that you've taught within Canvas before and all of the, the courses and the course materials that you've used for course reserves. So as you can see, I have some classes from spring and winter 2014 even, or back to 2015. Um, so within this window, you can search for the previous course that you taught and import the items. So I know that I want to import items from this course. Um, one thing I should note over here is that on this reserve item section, it will say, zero items available for some of the courses because after a course is taught within Canvas, um, all of the course reserve materials are taken offline uh, after the quarter is over, but they're still available. And if you import that material into your new course, it will activate it and tell our course reserve staff to make that electronically available. So this only works for electronic content. It won't work for books that you've had, obviously, previously on reserve. 
Um, but just know that you don't need to worry if it says zero items available because once you do this process, it actually will be available. So I'm gonna click on import items and then that will bring you to a new page where you will see a listing of all of your items. All of the items are automatically checked. And so if you have a really long list and you only want to check a few of them and import them over, you might wanna use this uncheck link right here and then select what you want. I want this PDF, this article, and then I'm gonna click import items. And then it's added it to my current course, um, just like that. So now this would be available for the students to click on and see. So that is scenario one. If you have questions about this, you can put them in the chat and then we'll answer them um, when I'm done going over the three different scenarios. So the second scenario would be that you need to add new digital items to your course. Um, this could be if perhaps you used to use course packs, um, but you're not using a course pack and you want to make sure that students can access articles that you found within library databases. Um, the library subscribes to many different journals and we have lots of different electronic content available online. So you can make that available to your students by inserting links within your Canvas course. So if you wanted to add links from databases so students can access e-content online from our databases, um, what you can do is click on the modules link over in the left menu. And then I'm sure many of you who are teaching classes already have your modules page organized in a way that you like it organized. Um, I wanted to add a few different um, scenarios or ways that you might organize this page. So I've seen some people do it week by week where all of the content for a certain week is included there. Um, I've seen others organize it all by, you know, they want all of their electronic articles together. So say you wanted to organize it week by week, here's where I would put all the content. Um, I'm going to add a new reading under week two. And so in order to add something new, you can click on this little plus button and then it'll show you the different content types. I'm going to choose external URL. And then for the URL, this is what we need to do. I'm going to go to, let's say you've already found the journal article that you want to link to. Um, different databases will have the permalink. It, somewhere else on the page. This is an EBSCO database, and so the permalink is found on the right side, but I know JSTOR has it on the left side. So whichever database you're using, just try to find a permalink, and then click on the permalink button. The page might need to be refreshed, and it does. Let me get that back. So I'm going to click on the permalink and then that will generate a link for you that's not going to break. So you can copy that and then go back to your Canvas course and insert that link there. Um, you would think that that would be the last step of the process, but because this is within a library database and people are accessing this content content from their homes, they're not within the network on Northwestern's campus. We also need to add a proxy prefix, which is um, just, a, a, it's a little bit of code that would go before the URL, um, and that would allow students and faculty and whoever is accessing this to um, be prompted to use their NetID and password to log in and gain access. So the proxy that we have, it's located in a couple of spots. I can paste it into the chat. Um, but it's also on our e-reserve page. So the library has an entire page that goes through all the instructions that I'm going over right now. And on this page, we have the proxy right here. So what you do is you copy this proxy, and then you go back to Canvas and you paste it right in front of the link that you just used from the data no spaces, just paste it right there so that it's one long string. And then you can name the page, maybe the author name or the title. Um, I'm gonna use the title because I can see it there. 
And then you need to click load in new tabs so that way students won't be navigated away from Canvas um, and so that they can access this in a different window. So make sure you check load a new tab and then click add item. And then the link to the article is now available to your students and you would do that for all of the articles that you want to share with them. So um, the third scenario would be that you rely on print materials to teach your course and you're not sure what to do now because you don't use online journals or databases and you don't have chapters to import from previous classes. Um, the first thing that we would suggest is that you talk to your subject librarian because they may be able to find um, an, an e-textbook. If you have an assigned textbook um, that, that you normally want students to have in print format and you put it on physical course reserve, um, our librarians are working to find as many e-textbooks as we can. And Steve's going to be going over this in a little bit about all of the temporarily free resources that are available now during COVID-19. Um, so if you reach out to your subject librarian with a specific title, a, a book that you want to see if it's available digitally, our librarians will sift through all that information and see if they can find it for you. And if it's something that we don't already own or that isn't available out there with one of the offers that are going on right now, the libraries can very likely purchase it for you and then make it available. Um, the second option would be that if it's not available as an ebook, then a librarian can also assist you with finding digital alternatives to it. Um, so we are subject experts and, and you can just reach out to us with those questions about content and, and trying to find something that might be suitable for your course. Um, the third option would be if you have the physical book yourself. Now, this isn't something that the library is officially saying, go out and do this. Um, but if you have the physical book yourself and you wanted to make one or two chapters available within your Canvas course, Fair Use says that um, up to 15% of a book can be scanned and made available online. So there are some options where people I know have used Tiny Scanner, which is an app that you can use on your phone to take photos of books or images and it will turn it into a PDF pretty easily that you can then export. Um, Adobe Scan is another app if you don't have a physical scanner yourself. Um, so those are the three scenarios that I wanted to cover. Are there any questions about course reserve? If not, I will hand it back to Steve. Oh, I see a couple. Let's see. Well, Megan says that OneDrive's phone app can scan directly to PDFs also. That's great, I haven't heard of that one. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm back. Thanks on now and um, what I'm going to do is cover um, a couple of library um, related resources. Um, I need to um, get my screen share together here and just hold for one second. Great, all right, here and sharing Chrome with all of you. <clears throat> Great, so um, again, um, it's harder to see the chat window when you're presenting. Um, so um, Lauren will monitor the chat while I'm presenting. And um, can everyone see the Google Scholar window? If you can't, just open your mic and say you can't but um, it should be okay. So um, Google Scholar is not a database that we um, pay for, um, but we um, do have a connection to it and it's something that, oh, don't start with me. <laughs> this is being recorded. Um, I really and truly hope that, um, this is not going to make me do a recapture. That came out of nowhere. I promise I tested this in advance. Um,
Please show you're not a robot. Okay. I'm going to have to go off script here. Um, I'm going to share a different, well, first I need to open it. I'm going to have to go in Firefox. Um, You have to be ready for anything with these databases. Um, okay, I'm gonna try this in Firefox and hopefully it won't give me any issues. Um, okay, we're gonna do a sample search for pand pandemic anxiety, um, which of course no one on this call has at all. I think we're all fine. Um, and what I'd like to, um, show you um, is that the find it at NU buttons, the link resolver buttons um, that link you back to Northwestern resources are here in Google Scholar, but from your home um, or on your computer, these may not be turned on. Um, again, just to demo these really quickly, um, when you click on the find it at NU button, it helps you to find out if Northwestern has a subscription for that item. Um, I'm sure many of you have used Google Scholar or used just a regular Google search and clicked on an item and you've hit a paywall, um, pay $50, pay $60, pay $70 for this item. Um, of course, as a Northwestern affiliate, you don't have to do that. Normally you're able to use our interlibrary loan service, which you will, um, we still have in a limited way, we're able to fulfill requests when we're able to find that item electronically, but when we're not able to find the item electronically, um, we can't create a new scan of it and um, neither can our, our partner institutions. So um, you can use the find it at NU button to find out if we have the full text. In, in this case, for this item, um, we have it in two different places. If we click here, it will take us to um, a place that has it and we can log in. And um, here we have the full text of the article. Um, if, um, so if you are in Google Scholar and you're not seeing um, the find it at NU buttons, I wanna show you how to turn those on. Um, basically, um, if you use that, what they're calling a hamburger menu on the top left, this little three line menu, if you click on that, click on settings, and then click on library links. You can search for your institution. Um, I already have mine on and checked, but this will just show you, this will show you how it works. And you can um, go to your institution, check mark it, and then you'll see the links for your institution. It's notice it's called different things in, in different places. But here it's called find it at NU. You can click save and it will save that into the preferences on your computer. If you clear your cookies often, or if, if you do this in a private, private browsing session, when that session closes, this will clear out and you, you'll um, have to do it again. Um, but now you know how to do it. Hamburger menu, settings, library links, search for your institution, check mark it, and save. Um, so, that is that. I also wanted to show you a, a, a little Google Scholar quirk. Um, it, sometimes you're looking for an article and you'll notice a reference that doesn't have a find it at a new button next to it. Um, and if I were to click on this, I may or may not get in. I might hit a paywall, but if I, if I just want to know if Northwestern has it and I don't see a find it at a new button, sometimes the find it at a new button is hidden behind this double arrow and it's named get it at NU. Don't ask why, well, we, I don't know why. I have sent emails about this and nobody can really figure it out because we don't pay for Google Scholar. Google kind of does their own thing. So just know that if you don't see the find it at NU button sitting out here, the get it at NU button might be behind the double arrow hidden away. And when you click on get it at NU, it works the same as the find it at NU, at least it works, <laughs> at least it works. And um, when you do that, you can find out if, if, if the library has that item. In this case, the library does not. 
So what I would say is um, click sign in, go to Northwestern users, and then um, it should give you an option for um, interlibrary loan. Um, it won't hurt to request the item. For some reason, this one isn't offering that option. Um, but um, you can always go to the interlibrary loan form and enter the data manually and um, make the request. But if we're not able to um, acquire it, um, that basically that's going to be more, more, more normal in these times because we can't depend on our, our um, partner institutions um, because they're not open, just like we have limited staffing, they have limited staffing. Um, it's another um, way that um, the COVID crisis is affecting all of us. So um, that um, so that's with Google Scholar, that's how you turn on the find it at NU buttons. And um, another thing I wanted to show you, um, I wanna open up the, chat and see if there are any um, questions. Oh, Lauren just shared a link, great. Um, so if there aren't any questions now, I'm gonna move on to Web of Science because I, I, there's a little a thing I like to show in Web of Science. Um, Web of Science is a great database, great interdisciplinary literature searching database, um, best for articles, but they do have a few books. Um, we'll stick with our pandemic search. Um, we'll just type in pandemic. And um, obviously you're gonna get a lot with a search that broad in general. Um, one of the thing, things I like about Web of Science is that you can, they, well, Web of Science tracks the number of times items have been cited. So right now this is defaulting to a sort um, based on date. So you're getting more recently dated materials first. I'm going to switch my sort to time cited to get the most highly cited items in um, the search. And you'll see that this item um, that was able to rise to the top um, um, has been cited 3,041 times. If by chance you're scrolling through and you see an article that um, looks really interesting, um, I, one trick I like with Web of Science is using one good article that you find of interest to find more good articles. So um, they have a little algorithm over here. Of course, you can find the, the items that have cited the item you're interested in, right? This item was written in 2019. It's been cited 1,700 times. You can click here and get those items. Um, you can also um, look at the, the references that were cited in the paper. But one thing I like is this view related records field. They have an um, automatic search that searches for related items. When you click on view related records, it will automatically, um, it'll use their alg algorithm to um, determine relatedness. And one way they, re they determine relatedness is by shared references. So if I'm scrolling through here and I really, um, like this article, Google Trends, a web-based tool for real-time surveillance of disease outbreaks. Um, if I like this article, and of course I like the article that I used, that I wanted related records for, um, I can click here on this shared references. Um, if I click on the five, I see the five items that were cited in common between those two articles that I'm interested in. Um, this is a, a good way to get a sense of the articles that maybe must be cited um, if you're going to participate in that scholarly conversation, if you're gonna write about that topic. Um, and of course, um, with everything in Web of Science, the find it and new buttons are there. So we've discovered something may here maybe that um, we hadn't seen before. Um, we can click on find it at NU to figure out if Northwestern has a current subscription for the publication. Um, and I know we have a subscription to science. And we can get science through a couple of places, JSTOR, we can get it through um, AAAS's website, uh, we can get it through Gale, we buy that content, content through multiple places, which is why one would use the find it at NU button. Google only, Google will generally take you just to um, the 
the place they recognize as the source of that content. Um, they offer a couple of other ways, but I, and I won't get into the weeds there, but here we tell you everywhere Northwestern pays for this stuff and you have access to it all, okay? So you can click on any of this, these links to get to the full text. Um, I'll use this JSTOR link um, partially because there's something I wanna cover about JSTOR. But before I go into that, I wanna check the chat for any questions. Um, and um, yeah, before I move on from Google Scholar or Web of Science, are there any, any questions about those resources? If so, you can turn your mic on and ask. Okay, if not, um, what I'm gonna do is move on to JSTOR's um, COVID program. So um, since we can't use um, course, um, you know, the scanning service for course reserves and the, <clears throat> excuse me, the interlibrary loan service that many of us have grown to depend on over time, um, we have some other options. Um, one of those options is um, the, yeah, one of those options, um, options that are popping up all over the place are these COVID-19 free resource programs. So JSTOR, for instance, is expanding um, the um, resources they offer to um, institu institutions that have sub subscriptions. So we buy a lot of content already from JSTOR, but we do not purchase everything they offer. Um, but through the COVID-19 program, they have turned on um, more than 35,000 ebooks. I think it's something we just added those records to our library catalog. And so there are lots of books that may not have been available in the library catalog um, last week um, or even yesterday. <laughs> um, they are there now. And so you may have a textbook for your course that um, is newly available via ebook um, and um, through the JSTOR program. So you may want to go through your syllabus and search for content um, because um, there may be things that we didn't have before that we do have now because JSTOR is offering them for free in response to the COVID crisis. Um, I see that there's a chat question. Oh. It's not. just me sharing the link to the library's guide. Uh, we have a couple of librarians, Jeff and Anna, who compile links to all kinds of um, these offers. And in some cases where we could, we provided information about the availability of certain items because some things aren't available to the Northwestern community or some things have an availability date up until May or, or sometime before the quarter ends. So um, you can start with that, that guide if you're curious about any of this free content. And if you have questions, reach out to your librarian. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of all over the place. Um, Cambridge Uni University Press has a program. Um, and, you know, each tab covers something different. Um, and here's a list of publishers. Maybe a book you've written um, is um, available for free now. Um, and if so, it's a great chance to send it to um, your family. And um, since they're in the house with nothing to do, they'll have time to read that book you wrote. Um, anyway, just joking. If uh, you um, have more questions about this, um, you can um, reach out to us, reach out to the library reference um, um, chat or email. Um, we can always answer questions about this. We're getting used to it ourselves um, because so many publishers are offering content for free. Another um, organization um, Hathi Trust has a COVID program. It's a bit more unique. So basically, um, for out of copyright materials, um, those materials were already available via Hathi Trust. What Hathi Trust is doing, um, a lot of the scans that exist in the Hathi Trust, um, Hathi Trust database um, came originally from the Google Book Project, which Northwestern participated in. But when the materials that were in copyright were scanned, um, those um, basically um, we can't provide access. We normally we can't provide access to those. But 
Hathi has a it has an emergency temporary access program, and um, the book you need might just be available through Hathi Trust. I know this is um, a little random and all over the place, so if it's confusing, um, just depend on your librarian. We're getting used to going and searching for item, but if um, you're inclined to be more independent and try it yourself. You can go to the Hathi Trust um, search and search for the name of a book you're interested in. Um, if Northwestern, if the book is in copyright and Northwestern um, owns a copy, um, Hathi will provide um, one user at a time access to the item. Um, and that's part of their emergency response program. And that is detailed here. So. Um, Hathi Trust, JSTOR, and lots of other um, sites are offering content that we wouldn't normally have access to because um, these are unprecedented times. And um, it's great that lots of organizations are responding this way. Um, so feel free to explore those resources. Um, I think um, that's it for this portion. Um, are there any questions before I um, move forward? We covered um, Google, Google Scholar, Web of Science, JSTOR, Hathi Trust. Um, and um, I guess with that, I'll pass the mic to Lauren and stop sharing. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, so I just wanted to touch briefly on VPN. Some of you may have questions about VPN. Um, VPN is something that is set up and managed by Northwestern Information Technology. Um, and the vast majority of library databases, you don't need VPN in order to access them away from, from campus. You can, it'll, um, the proxy will send you in and you can use your net ID and password to access them. Um, but you may need VPN uh, for security a secure connection um, or um, possibly to access other Northwestern resources like Kronos. So I just wanted to share the website with you um, and say that the VPN is migrating over to a new platform. It's Global Protect and the date for that switchover is May 15th. So if you have a Northwestern computer, if if you're a staff member and you have a computer that you're working off of at home, it should already be installed on your machine. If not, Northwestern um, IT has some really clear instructions. I ended up finding these just by Googling Northwestern and VPN, um, but I can also put it in the chat. Um, so you would download the VPN and then you also need MFA or multi-factor multi authentication in order to access it. Um, it took me probably in total maybe 20 minutes to set it up and now I can easily connect to the VPN every day. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is general library services that we offer in addition to all of this e-content and helping you sift through um, e-resources and, and possibly buying new e-textbooks for your classes. Um, our librarians also provide other services such as one-on-one -on -one consultations either with you or with your students. I know that I've had questions from faculty who we had scheduled instruction sessions prior to all this happening and then after the libraries closed they said are you all still there? Are you still working? And the answer is yes, we're all still here and we're ready to provide um, virtual assistance to help support your classes. So if you want to send your students to us for consultations, if they have specific research questions, you can do that. And we can also meet with you for individual consultations. Um, we also do class instruction and because of our virtual environment, that we've been given a lot more options now, actually, I think. So I'm, um, as an example, this quarter, I'm uh, doing some library instruction for a couple of classes, one of which has turned asynchronous because of the time that it was scheduled and there are students from it from all across the country. And so in order to provide support for the students who are working on a research project, um, I created a series of Panopto videos that teach students how to use library databases. So if you're teaching a class asynchronously, asynchronously, librarians can create videos for you that you can then embed into your Canvas course. Um, if you're teaching in real time or you have real time sessions with your students, uh, subject librarians can 
uh, work with you to give a live presentation to your class to demo databases and talk about library research and talk about um, finding e-content and uh, critical thinking skills and things like that. Um, we can also assist you with course development and research components. So if you're working on assignments and you want to be able to incorporate library research into your assignment, uh, reach out to your librarian and we can talk about the assignment and talk about ways that we might be able to support you in developing that assignment further. And then finally, we also create these lovely research guides, which I will show you. So um, since the libraries have so many databases and there's so much content to sift through, it can be overwhelming for students. And so um, we create these research guides, which are curated lists of databases, and we can do it for subjects. So for instance, in my subject area, I have a guide that is just more general communication studies research guide but I've also created guides that are for specific classes. So a faculty member will give me their assignment and I'll look at that and then I'll create a custom guide choosing databases either in collaboration with them or just based off of what I think might be best for their assignment um, and then add those to the guide. So if you don't necessarily think that um, you need a librarian to come to your class and give a presentation or videos, but you would like one of these guides, we're also happy to create that for you. Um, and that, I believe, is all that we wanted to cover. And now we have a chat. And it is more links. We're just giving you all the links. Um, but I think that we can open it up for questions now. We have about 15 minutes. So we can have a discussion if you have questions. And um, it can even be specific questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, feel free to take us into the weeds um, of your specific questions. You may have come to get specific um, questions answered. Um, and yeah, you're, you're welcome to ask anything about um, what we've covered or other things. Oh, and you're welcome, Elizabeth, you're welcome to turn your mic on. Um, okay. Oh, um, the, what was the resource I used to create citations and an automatic bibliography? Um, do you, um, are you talking about in this workshop or in? In a um, previous one. So I was looking for the oh. resource that you had used previously on, um, to make citations and a bibliography. Yes, I'll uh, show you that really quickly. Um, it's called Zotero. Um, I'm, because of, well, you know what, this actually might work. Um, I'll be, just be completely spontaneous here. Um, so that is Zotero and um, we offer, um, on the library webpage, you'll see that we're offering two citation management workshops um, coming up soon. And um, I'll, but I'll sort of share with everyone what it is. This is a great tool for, for you if you haven't been using something like Zotero or EndNote. Um, it's great. Um, oh, wow, I did not know this. I learned something new. Z Z Zotero has a COVID-19 program. They're offering unlimited file storage online for the duration of the a crisis. Um, OK, that's great. Anyway, Zotero is um, a free tool for managing um, your personal library. Um, you can use it to collect resources, um, create um, cited references. So um, I think I shared my whole desktop. And so it's opening my Zotero account and you'll see that my personal library is here. Um, you'll see that my wife is a film scholar and I do research for her. I'm the secret to her success. You should marry a librarian. Um, <laughs> I uh, also um, have um, my own research here on curiosity and I have lots of different folders here. And, um, you know, um, I can basically go to any um, database and um, add resources from these databases, import them here 
and then I can take um, a group of resources and create a bibliography. Um, I'll um, open this up and create a bibliography from items, create it in APA format, and I'll go um, to Microsoft Word, create a new document and paste that bibliography in APA format. Um, so to answer your question, Zotero is the program. I just wanted to do a quick um, demo of that um, to give people context. Also, there is a Microsoft Word plugin for Zotero um, and we can answer questions about, more questions about Zotero after the session. Sounds good, thank you. Sure. Any, um, um, any other questions? Um, if you have, um, if you're teaching um, this quarter and by chance you need, um, if, you, if you think students should know this, um, we in the library can come in um, again, do a guest um, lecture for your students. Um, just contact your sub subject librarian or contact us and we will refer you um, um, as needed. Um, and if there aren't any other questions, um, librarians, feel free to ask questions if by chance you had any. I know you know most of this stuff already, but um, if we, if all hearts and minds are clear, we can close the session. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. Um, I'm glad to assist. Um, let us know if you need further assistance. Thank you. Bye all. Take care, Elizabeth.